So welcome all to the Stress and Anxiety Workshop for College Students, sponsored by NAMI North Carolina. We are the largest grassroots nonprofit organization dedicated to building better lives for all of those affected by mental illness. We are here today to learn some tricks and tips for managing your stress and anxiety this semester, because let's face it, we know that college students tend to face a little bit more stress in their day-to-day -day lives than the average person. We hope that you enjoy this workshop and learn some take-home tools to help to support your whole health, mind, body, and soul. If you have any questions throughout the workshop, please put them and type them into the chat box and we will address them after the presentation. I will be behind the scenes managing the chat box. So if at any time you feel uncomfortable, triggered or unsafe, please privately message the host and I will contact you right away. This event will be recorded, but we do invite you to turn on your cameras and know that this is a safe and comfortable space. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce your actual hosts of the workshop today. Catherine McCoy, can you give us a wave? Catherine is a mother, provisional licensed therapist and entrepreneur operating out of Durham, North Carolina. In 2020, she collaborated with NAMI to co-found NAMI North Carolina's first NAMI on campus at a HBCU, North Carolina Central University. Moreover, she has experience working with college students around mental health and has even co-facilitated virtual support groups on their behalf. Her work was also compiled into a procedural document on how the group was configured and facilitated to lay out the path for other mental health advocates and trained professionals to support all in need. Angela Huang, can you give us a wave? Angela is a sophomore at Duke University pursuing a self-made major title a self-made major titled Ethical Mental Healthcare Policy. In the NAMI at Duke chapter, they act as the co-chair for the Community Engagement Committee, leading panels and outreach efforts in Durham and in Duke. Outside of NAMI, they work with NCPAL, Crisis Text Line, and Threshold Clubhouse in an effort to improve mental health both locally and nationally. Angela is passionate about leveraging health policy to generate positive change in the mental health care field and aspires to become an MD, MPH, specializing in psychiatry. So without further ado, I will turn it over to your two hosts of the night. Thanks, Michaela, for that really great introduction. Um, I just wanted to quickly mention that I'm especially passionate about this presentation because how I've seen how I've personally and those close to me have been influenced by the college experience. I think a lot of people um, idealize the college experience very much and that has led to a lot of um, problems for people's mental well-being. So I'm really excited to walk through this with everybody. Thank you for that introduction as well. Let me say I am very, very honored to be here and share information, share tips that I've picked up along the way in my undergraduate and graduate studies with you all to answer any questions that you have and discuss the topic at hand. I am super, super excited and passionate about this because mental health is health. And so for starting off, let me say, let's start by differentiating in between stress and anxiety. And you can move along to slide one, please. So we'll start with that. Stress is a response to an external cause and disappears once the situation is resolved. It can be positive or negative. This is familiar to us all, right? It can be work-related. It can be school-related. Um, stresses can be family-related. They can be relationship-related. And so, some small examples of that or specific examples of that could be a big test or an interview, a new partner, right? Or fighting with a friend or family member. For this next section, I want to explain that overwhelming stress triggers a survival response in the body. And in some cases, when the fight response is overactive, this causes symptoms to manifest. So when you look at this mental section, that's what I want you to think if that helps. And that goes into excessive worry, restlessness, tension, headaches, soreness in the body, right? Gut issues. And that goes into appetite changes, weight changes, right? Pressure in the chest, feeling breathless, loss of sleep, impacts to your blood pressure. 
all of those things can happen when stress and anxiety are paired together and they affect the mind and the body. And then lastly, with anxiety. Anxiety is internal and ongoing. And these aspects can be tied to thought content, right? So your thoughts or feelings are something. Anxiety may sound like persistent, overwhelmed worry about threats that are not present, right? And ultimately, it can impact us in our day-to-day -day lives and our connections. And I'm sure to some degree, we all know the way that stress and anxiety can pair up together and really have, um, have us in a hard position. And so I want to be able to talk about that a little bit more. I'm going to switch over to Angela on the next slide. So I just wanna give a quick overview of sort of like the bodily reasoning for what creates the stress and anxiety. This may be a repeat to a lot of you guys from intro biology or neuroscience classes, but I just wanted to give an overview of the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. These two nervous systems are part of something called the autonomic nervous system, which is sort of the umbrella nervous system over these two. And the autonomic nervous system controls bodily function and isn't consciously regulated. For example, you can't think of making your heart beat in a given instance. So in your parasympathetic nervous system, this parasympathetic nervous system is most active during periods of rest. So when you're sitting, watching a TV show, hanging out with a friend, just relaxing, you'll have a slower heart rate, you'll have lower blood pressure, it'll stimulate your digestion. Overall, this is. Um, this seems relatively positive. Um, for the sympathetic nervous system, this will be a direct response to danger. It'll increase your heart rate, dilate blood vessels, and slow digestion. This is oftentimes a beneficial response when there is a physical threat in our way. Let's imagine that we're being chased by a murderer. This is all very beneficial to helping us run away. But in the modern world, more realistically, our stressors are um, much more ongoing and excessive stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system can result in very negative bodily consequences. Um, if you can flip to the next slide, Michaela. So here, are the, these are some of the effects of chronic stress or chronic overstimulation of your sympathetic nervous system. Um, three that I've highlighted here that I think are especially common among college students is burnout, depression, and anxiety disorders. So I think it's really important to consider the ways that college is very much like a constant stress machine, stress machine whether it be just homework, assignments, um, or stresses with friends. This is something that can create chronic stress where over and over again, you're constantly thinking about problems um, that may result and the effects of chronic stress are evidently quite serious. So as we go forward, we want to sort of explore the ways um, and the causes of stress in college and also some strategies to relieve that stress. Oh. Moving forward, it is now time to brainstorm. So we've got to the introductory part and we wanna ask you all to share, what are some examples of stress in college? I will participate and just name out one. Um, a stressor in college could be low funds. Do we really Angela. Like unmute? Um, hi. Hi, would you all like to share, share some examples, food insecurity in the chat. Uh, how about um, like a, a PowerPoint where you have to uh, present in front of presentations. the Presentations, uh, yeah, presentations, anything else? Roommate Study attention. Studying Lots of homework. Attention. Homework, <laughs> great. I love it, anybody else? So all these things can be stressors. Making new friends, yes. Putting pressure on your... Oh, sorry, Isabel. Sorry. <laughs> You're good. Um, I definitely want to shout out Jackson's um, comment, triggering classwork material. I, I feel like I've seen of many instances where uh, teachers will forget to either put a trigger warning or something on that um, 
and I, I've had a couple of instances where some of my friends have had some difficulties with that. So I definitely want to acknowledge that as a as a big stressor among college students. And I'm thank you so much for highlighting that, Angela and Jackson, because yes, I've heard of classwork material on certain subjects being very triggering for people. Group projects, yes, can be a source of stress. Thank you all so much for participating um, in that brainstorming question. In this next segment, you can move on to the next slide. We have highlighted several strategies for fast relief and anxiety. So this is the point where I'm gonna ask you all to please invite you all to take notes, to depend on things that you maybe have questions about, jot down any of the strategies that grab your attention, okay? I'm gonna give everyone a moment. You ready? Okay, you can go on to the next slide. So for the first technique, the five, four, three, two, one technique, right? Self-explanatory, five things I see. I see my water, my candle, my second candle, um, my phone, my notebook, and my journal. Five things I can feel. I can feel my hair tie. I can feel my hands. I can feel my knees and my back. Three things I can hear, traffic, a dog, and my kid in the other room, okay? Two things I can smell, peppermint that I have and my candle. And one good thing about myself, I am me. That's a good thing about me. Next slide, please. Let me say that if your response to that last question was followed by some negative self-talk, don't fret, there are ways to control it. So with this slide, I'm gonna read from some of these. This is the point where I'm gonna ask you all to, if you have questions, please chat them and I'll be happy to um, answer them on the back end, dive into it a little bit more. I'm gonna dive into some that I see here. So affirmations from my, or based on my clinical experience, I would say the best way to approach affirmations are to one, be mindful of your language, right? Are there words or phrases that are triggering you that induce more stress or anxiety? If there are, are there ways that you can swap out those words or redefine what those words mean, right? So for example, strong, what does strong mean? What does strong induce? Does it induce anxiety and stress for you? Does exercise induce anxiety and stress for you? An example of swapping words out for language sake, exercise would be staying active, right? Another thing that's very important with affirmations how are you talking to yourself? That is important. I always share with everyone that I talk to myself like a homegirl and that works for me because I'm my best friend, right? But someone else may need to talk to their self in another way. And so it's easy to go online and find all types of affirmations for anything, right? Affirmations or statements to deal with test anxiety, affirmations to deal with stress, to deal with anxiety, right? All of these things but it is okay to tailor them to yourself. And those are two tips for doing that, okay? Thought swap, I would love to dive into this a little bit more, but this goes back into thought content. What are the type of things that are coming up for you as far as thoughts? What are some ways that you may be able to swap or change what is being thought, right? Or to counteract the anxious thought that's there, right? Or to question the truth and an anxious thought. Because sometimes, if, I, if we're being completely honest, sometimes anxiety will lie to you. In situations where you think there is a threat, there may not be a threat, right? So thought swapping, that's another. Declutter your room or your apartment. I think it's important that I share this with everyone because this is something that I use in my own life. Um, with decluttering your room or apartment, Consider bartering. 
consider asking, asking for support in the form of a gift, right? If you have someone in your life that you are comfortable with coming into your environment, consider asking them for help if you need help with cleaning your room. There is no shame in that, okay? Let me tell you, I have, for my birthday, asked siblings, clean my closet. I have things I'm looking for that I can't find. And so that's one tip with that. Generate self-care strategies. We're going to dive a little bit more into that in the next slide with a visual. Schedule consistent time for self-care. The way that this shows up is if I'm being honest, if you can make time to attend this Zoom meeting, you can make time to take care of yourself. If you prioritize taking um, time to study or going to class, prioritize your own health in that same way. Give yourself 15 minutes, give yourself 30 minutes, give yourself an hour, right? Make it a regular thing and treat the appointment as if it were an appointment for anything else that is important in your life. Gratitude journaling. Journaling overall, I really like this as a way to cope in general, but definitely showing appreciation for the things that you have, right? Celebrate your wins. Let's talk about it. I want to know, just by a raise of hand, how many of you all are freshmen? Any freshmen here? Any sophomores? Juniors? Seniors? You all have something to celebrate. I want you to take time to acknowledge that. Too often in life do we set goals and we hit the mark and we keep going. It is okay to pause, to breathe and say, wow, I did X, Y, and Z to get here. I'm so happy I stuck with this path, right? You all have something to celebrate. So please, please, please celebrate your wins, right? A good way to approach this, if you have difficulty with this, I will encourage people to celebrate your wins as if you're talking about a best friend or a loved one. She did that, he or she did that, right? They did that. They accomplished something so great. Talk about it like you're giving them an award, but really it's you giving yourself an award. You are deserving of that. Please, please celebrate your wins. Stop comparing yourself. And this is a joke, the LinkedIn part, right? So don't, I mean, I know there's a lot of opportunity for us to compare ourselves with social media, right? It's there. The only advice that I could possibly offer in this situation for approaching this as a coping mechanism would be to consider what about this social media or online platform is triggering for you. Ask yourself that question. Once you answer that question, you'll be on the path to be able to ask yourself more questions and go in the direction that you could benefit from. So for example, if your feed is the issue, I wouldn't necessarily say, well, just delete the whole app. No, maybe you need to change your feed. Maybe you could tailor your feed to things that make you feel positive. Maybe you could follow, unfollow or block accounts that make you feel very triggered, right? And maybe if the situation depends on it, limit your time on these platforms. But this is all gonna be based on your self-awareness of what is happening with you and what are the ways in which triggers are showing up for you, right? And so the next thing, do small, easy, productive tasks, baby steps. I say with this, very carefully, be mindful of how many steps you put down at a time. We do not want to create a list that feels never ending. And we don't wanna create a list that is too daunting for us. So if three things are enough for you, do three things, right? After you complete those things, take a breather. 
It is okay to acknowledge that you have fulfilled something. That will be your fuel to keep going. Spend time with your support circle. It's very important that I highlight with this, the reason it doesn't say friends, family, loved ones, is because it is important to spend time with the people who love you and you love back. I would never encourage anyone to spend time in groups or environments where they feel triggered, they feel harmed, they feel at danger. So spend time with your support group. Spend time with your support circle. Who do you rely on for emotional support? Call that person, sit with them, watch a movie. Maybe not have a conversation at all, but spend time there. The next one is just a visual aid, right? This is a good tool that could be used for how to assess which area of your life needs attention or care, right? So professional self-care being taking a lunch or break, right? Getting support from colleagues, physical self-care, eating healthy, me time, staying active, personal self-care, planning goals and growth, fostering healthy relationships, mental self-care, therapy, journaling, emotional self-care, affirmations and forgiveness, spiritual self-care, fostering self-forgiveness. So just to add in another example of a great strategy to use is to create a mantra before an instance that may be stressful and then learn to repeat a mantra in that instance. Um, so like a lot of the things that Catherine has also said, um, a lot of these activities are designed to sort of slow down your sympathetic nervous system, make sure that you calm down a little bit. Um, allows you to focus on a singular thing. And especially a mantra will allow you to concentrate on a specific positive emotion. Um, some examples of mantras are this moment will pass and I'll be okay. I'm safe and well, and I know I can handle this because I've overcome other challenges. And I would love if everybody could go in the chat and either put in other mantras that they could think of or perhaps mantras that they've used in the past. Um, I think mantras are especially powerful um, considering that they can really call to mind uh, instances where you have overcome things before. Um, so for example, if I got a bad grade on the test, by repeating that mantra, perhaps I can remember a time where I absolutely crushed one or perhaps even times when I failed one, but then I was fine right after. Uh, I really love the ones that I'm seeing in the chat right now. Um, Anu has a really great one. I'm loved, I'm loving, I'm lovable. I think that is really, really beautiful. Um, I'm a powerful manifester. I think that is also really, really, really interesting to show how um, you are in control of your own future. Um, Catherine's, I am not um, my grades. That is really powerful, especially for college students. Um, Victoria's 1% is still better. Um, storms don't last forever. I feel calm about myself. I feel acceptable to myself. I feel good about accepting myself. That's really nice. Um, I am more than my disability. That is really, really beautiful as well. I can shine by being myself. This too shall pass. My worth is not determined by others. These are really, really, really great examples of mantras to use in the future. Um, I really suggest that if anybody saw any in the chat that they feel especially they especially resonate with, write that down and try to think of that next time you get really stressed. So another strategy that I use pretty often in my own life is something called the 10-10-10 strategy, where it comes down to four simple questions. Um, this is especially useful when you know an instance may not be that important, but but you still feel very overwhelmed by your emotions. So I'll go back to that example of, um, I failed a test and maybe even it's like a small test, but I'm just so upset, I'm so stressed about it. Just sitting there and saying, will this matter in 10 minutes? And probably, yes, it probably will matter in 10 minutes. I probably will be pretty upset. Will this matter in 10 hours? Well, maybe I'll take a nap, I'll wake up in the morning, I'll get some breakfast and maybe it'll matter a little less, but perhaps I'll still be upset. 
will this matter in 10 months? Most realistically, no. <laughs> and frankly, in 10 months, it, it won't affect me that much. And then in 10 years, you'll see that perhaps it didn't matter at all. So I, I think this, this strategy is really powerful because it'll give you more space and more perspective over time. And especially with anxiety, um, I think it's really often that you have something called like washing machine thinking, where you're just keep on turning over the same things over and over again. So whenever you use these strategies, try to gain some distance from whatever you're experiencing so that you can understand it a little bit better. So this is also something that is really great. Um, I'll, I'll also say that I feel like I've used this in my personal life by telling my friends that this is a really great strategy for me. And um, if I'm ever having a panic attack or I'm feeling really anxious, I'll just call them and they can really help me walk through it, um, either telling me some instructions. Um, square breathing in particular is basically tracing a square, um, breathing in deeply for three seconds, holding your breath for one second, breathing out for three seconds and holding in for one second. And by doing this, you'll slow down your sympathetic nervous system again, trying to take things one at a time, not trying to think about whatever's stressing you out at the time, just focusing on this very simple physical movement. And over that period, especially as you regulate your breathing more, you'll find that you're a little more relaxed and you can perhaps do some other activities that may be also self-care related, whether it just be knitting, crocheting, watching a movie, something really simple and calming that you can try and get out of your stress state. So I also wanted to quickly shout out some apps for stress management. I also want to specify Navi North Carolina is not sponsored by any of these or anything like that. We just found some really good ones from online and um, they're often very useful during a time where the pandemic has limited our ability to go and see actual providers. And um, by having this ability to have sort of like self-care is really important. So as for Headspace, the only thing I'll say about this is see if your college offers a free version. I know Duke at least for a little bit had a free trial version where you could use it and they would pay for it. So try and see if there's any opportunities because I know the subscription is around $5 per month, which may be out of some people's price range. Um, as for a really great free um, meditation app, there's the Insight Timer. It has many, many meditation videos. Um, some a mood tracker, a sleep aid, and this is a really great um, resource to use um, during times when you just wanted to calm down in that moment. There's panic relief. Uh, this application can probably help you in the midst of like an actual panic attack, um, probably using some of the strategies that we've laid out here, but allowing you to walk through those steps um, just like a, as if you were like calling a friend to try and help you out. Finally, I found this application really interesting. It's called MindShift. It uses cognitive behavioral therapy strategies, which is a common strategy used in therapy today. It is completely free and it just allows you to walk through some of your thought patterns and the ways that you think about things um, to try and promote healthy um, sort of thought processes in the future. Um, so here are three more. I found Sanvela really interesting because it is insurance-based. So you may be able to get it free if you have some insurance access. I point this out again, because I know that a lot of students are having a lot of trouble accessing um, care. So consider some telehealth or telemedicine options. Um, Bloom CBT therapy is very similar in the sense that it is allowing for self-therapy and also guides journaling. And finally, Pacifica is another meditation app where it helps you with the more physical element of relaxation with deep breathing and muscle relaxation. Apologies, let me say that again and louder. Brainstorm. I would like for everyone to, if you are in or if you are able to participate, what are some other coping strategies that you may use, things that we haven't named or things that you may have been intrigued by during that segment of fast relief from anxiety? Going for a walk, feel free to share. You can chat, unmute yourself, speak. 
great music, listening to music, playing with pets, doing an activity you love, journaling, a notebook to dump all emotions with no filter. I like that. Take a shower, take my dog outside. Soul food, good one, I like that. <laughs> Playing a sport, baking. Playing my guitar, find a safe space to put your mind at ease. That is nice, I like that. Let me also say with playlists or music, does anyone have a particular playlist that they create? Getting my feet done, taking a bath. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you all so much for sharing. Okay, let's transition into the next slide, please. So this is sort of the final section. Once again, I'll just be giving a really, really quick overview of some background, I guess, like biological information that can help us understand how we react to stress a little bit better. So serotonin is a hormone that stabilizes your mood, feelings of well-being and happiness. A lot of modern depression medication is based off of serotonin. And new research has shown that there's something called the gut-brain access that um, is really important to creating better mental health. So um, this research has shown that a lot of the serotonin is produced in the gut. And when you have gut issues and inflammation, um, often linked to mental disorders, think about the time that you're anxious and your stomach was grumbling. It can, this research shows that it's basically like a two-way street, that the food you eat um, ultimately can influence your mental well-being and the same way of your mental well-being can affect your gastrointestinal tract. Um, so this is really, really important to consider going forward, I think especially for college students, where it's really, really difficult um, to access healthy, good food and making sure that you're taking care of your physical well-being. Um, healthy foods activates, re activate receptors on the vagal nerve, um, which is one of the biggest nerves that connects your gut and brain and affects this connection. Um, so going forward, I think Catherine will discuss a little bit about regulating your diet in college. Yes, I will. So what we eat is very important because of that gut brain access. And Angela, thank you so much for explaining the science behind that. With all of that being said, be mindful of your diet because it can help with your health, right? So I think two important uh, takeaways from this would be access to healthy food, right? What are options that are close to you, whether you live on campus or off campus, right? And access also in the way of having healthy food close by. Is it in your refrigerator, whether that be in your dorm or in your apartment? If you spend a lot of time outside your home, are you taking snacks with you? Are stores where you can purchase grocery stores, cafes, local shops, or markets available to where you can go and get healthy food options, right? All of these are very important. And there are some um, specific takeaways for magnesium ways to increase your magnesium intake, right? Spinach, collard greens, avocados, bananas, broccoli, pumpkin seeds, probiotics, low-fat Greek yogurt, kombucha, dark chocolate. And so in the next slide, there will be some additional ones as well. You can actually transition into the next one. Back one, <laughs> sorry. And so fatty acids such as salmon, sardines, tuna, and amino, a very specific amino acid, tryptophan, which is present in oatmeal, turkey, spinach, and more along with vitamin C and potassium can help you with the dietary approach to managing or tackling stress and anxiety. Um, some other takeaways that I think are very important for me to include in this segment of diet in college is understanding, again, access. What is close to you? What are you easily able to go and get, right? Even if that be out of the cabinet, out of the refrigerator, what is accessible to you? What are you putting in your body? Are you hydrating enough, right? A technique or a mindset that I use, which may be considered thought changing, right? Around food would be rainbow eating. 
So if you aren't getting a lot of vegetables, I suggest that you maybe approach it in that manner, right? Rainbow eating. Fill your plate up with the colors of the rainbow. Pick things that are vibrant reds, yellows, greens, right? That are vegetables and fruits and eat those things. Um, let me say that even if you have a specialized diet, there are ways to approach your dietary habits and improve them if you would like to approach this way of tackling your stress and anxiety. I think one quick note that I really wanted to add to um, diet is that um, I think it's important to acknowledge that a lot of college students are more prone to disordered eating. Um, this is really a big time of being self-conscious, having issues with your body image. I think there was actually a comment in the chat earlier on as that identifying that as a stressor. And I think one of the really powerful ways of changing your mindset about diet is just thinking about what makes you feel good when you eat it. Not maybe just right in that moment, but also in the longer run of the day. So I'm lactose intolerant. It feels really good to eat ice cream in the moment, but I know it'll feel really terrible afterwards. Thinking about the ways that you can um, try and shift food away from the actual image of uh, your personal body and more so in how you feel. So try, try and embody food more as a tool of self-care as opposed to something of self-harm. Mm -hmm. I know that's a very simplistic, but um, I think that's really important to mention as um, a college student. And I would like for um, the question that was asked, what about mental image? If you can expound upon that a little bit more. And I think it is very, um, Angela, thank you so much for actually speaking on body image issues, body dysmorphia eating disorders, um, which can be present in college age students. Let me say again, self-awareness, what is, what is triggering about food for you, right? Do certain foods trigger you? Do certain clothing items trigger you, right? Because if we are talking about certain, certain clothing items triggering you, then there's a whole nother spill versus if you are triggered by certain foods or certain eating environments, right? Are you more okay with eating to yourself versus eating with other? All of these things matter in the spectrum of approaching diet in college. And so again, big takeaways. Let me also say that consider what you're able to eat. Consider if you have any allergies. Consider if you're a vegetarian, pescatarian, vegan, all these things, but make eating, and I, I hate to make it sound so light, but make eating something that you do for your health. Okay. And so, Angela, I'll let you take it away on navigating treatment for a moment. Yes, so I just wanted to take a quick minute um, and share my own experiences navigating mental health treatment and certain strategies that college students can use when they feel like they're in a mental crisis. So um, first, I want to acknowledge it's really difficult to get a therapy, uh, a therapist today, and I want to acknowledge that it might take a little bit more, it might take a few weeks, it might take a month, um, and it's really challenging currently with a lot of high demand for a therapist today. I'm sure Catherine can definitely test to that. Um, so the first thing I would suggest is approaching um, college resources first. They're often the most accessible, both transportation wise and monetarily. That way you should also identify the correct venue. Um, if it has to do with your sexual being or sexual mental health, you can go to the Women's Center um, as compared to the counseling and psychological services. I personally found actually a lot of help through going to the Women's Center um, because they offer some specialized mental health services that were um, that I personally needed. So thinking outside of the box of where you may be able to get those resources um, is really, really important. Um, I personally went down the route eventually to find some local therapists. And when you're going into that, you really need to consider um, your transportation and insurance access, as well as how you're going to manage that with your personal school schedule. Um, again, I acknowledge that's really, really difficult for a lot of students, but if you think that's feasible for you, 
there are resources and databases online where you can look for people who uh, attend to your specific um, needs um, within the mental health fields. When you do that, I would suggest that you construct, construct a list of questions before you ask any individual therapist. Um, interview them as though you're interviewing anybody because they're there to help you. Think about their style of therapy, the frequency at which you want to see them, ask them about what they specialize in, what's their approach to therapy. This is all really, really important because you're, you want to be able to find someone who can support you um, and not many, many people. You don't want to keep on switching therapists over time. So oftentimes being sure that this is the right person for you is really, really important. Um, I would also suggest considering a gap semester if it's a little bit more serious. I know this is something that seems a little more dire for a lot of college students, but if it really is affecting your well-being, your well-being is more important than school. Always, always. It really, really does matter to be able to um, consider yourself. I don't think it's selfish. I think it's really, really important to be able to get through college um, in one piece. Uh, finally, I would suggest even if you have parents who are unaccepting to your um, sort of mental health, try as much as you can to sort of navigate that realm. I recognize that a lot of people don't have insurance without their parents. Um, so overcoming those challenges even over time can be really helpful. Um, and oftentimes your parents will survive, uh, surprise you um, in how they respond to your mental health. Uh, for mine, I didn't really expect mine to be very welcoming or accepting, but when I talk to them, it, it just, they're, they're, um, they're concerned about my mental well-being really, really trumped all. Like it was the most important that I was okay. And so as long as you approach from the space of, I just want to be able to do the best that I can, be the best person I can, um, try and navigate that with your family as much as possible. Um, Catherine, if you have any other thoughts. Yes. Um, I just want to say, I am here for, even as a therapist, interview potential therapists, ask them, find out what are um, things that they have a familiarity with, right? Um, see if there's any rapport that can be built in between you. See if there's any connection that's there because whoever you're gonna be talking to, it's gonna be so important to show up as your authentic self and be truthful to get the work done as far as helping to improve your well-being or mental or emotional health, right? So it is absolutely okay for you to interview your therapist. Let me also say furthermore, with seeking therapy, if there are any challenges around insurance or copayment, let me say this plain and clear, find out if the agency or if the therapist has a sliding, scale for you to pay, even if you have insurance. I have seen individuals with insurance and their copayments are $150. If $150 is too much, not financially feasible for you, you can still apply for a sliding scale and ask them to reduce your copayment. That is going to be huge. If you don't have insurance, apply for a sliding scale and see if there are any places that are offering um, if any therapists, right, provisional licensed therapists or not even provision, interning therapists have any openings where they are, are doing free therapy, right, so that they can gain experience, go into those spaces, right? All of those are very important tips that I mentioned with that. Let me also say, keep in mind, are you looking for someone that is going to be understanding of certain things? in your life, culturally, economically, or any other area, right? So for example, if you are African-American and you're looking for an African-American therapist, there are search engines geared towards finding a therapist in that realm. If you are religious, right? Whether that be Muslim, Christian, whatever, and you would like a therapist that is on the same page as you religion-wise, right? See if there are spaces in which you can find those individuals. Um, let me also speak to Angela's sentiment on consulting your parents, right? Let me say that it's important that we gauge who has the capacity to understand mental health. 
sorry to say it, but not everyone does. So if you are consulting someone, ask yourself, do they have the capacity to understand? Give them a chance, right? Because for our parents, they're, them being older, right? Them being of a different generation, more than likely, their thoughts on mental health may not be the same. And so we may have to teach them along our own journey. So as we're finding out about anxiety for ourselves, share that material with whoever you're connecting with and consulting. Um, let me also say, furthermore, I definitely would like to encourage you all to continue to seek treatment, seek support. Do not be afraid to ask for help. Do not be afraid to say that you need some support. Right. Don't be afraid to venture into the space of your university and reach out and find out what resources are available to you all. I promise you there are some things out there that could help you if you're having a challenge in time. You are not alone. You are not alone. And dealing with stress and anxiety, sometimes we may feel that we are alone and that we are the only one who has ever experienced this. And that is not the case. So please take up any opportunity to um, ask any questions to us, um, take up any opportunity to use the coping skills and mechanisms that we have discussed, and take up any opportunity to call upon the resources, the apps, the search engines, right? Psychology Today, your university. Try those things. I promise you something good will happen. The floor is now open for a Q&A. And just to be accessible or accessible as possible, as much as possible, if you would like to speak instead of typing, please raise your hand and we will go in an orderly fashion. Otherwise, you can use the chat and we'll be happy to answer any questions at this time. I have a question for you. Could you give us an example of the thought swap method that you talked about? Hmm, okay. Thought swap. One that I like is, is this true? And I think I kind of mentioned this. Anxiety can lie to us. And so sometimes anxiety may tell us, don't do that. It's going to be the worst thing ever. You're not going to be able to recover from it. And for myself, I may have to say, well, is that true? Remember that time in elementary when you broke the swing? You thought you weren't going to recover from that, and you did. It was embarrassing, but you recovered, right? And so having that moment of truth for myself or saying, for example, with a test that I may not have done well on, oh, my God. I made a bad score. This is the end. I'm not going to pass this class. I should just give up now and quit school, right? The truth may be that I did not prepare. That may be the truth for me, right? Or the truth may be that I know the way in which I prepared this time and that didn't work. So I know where I need to change some things up, right? Or the truth may be that I've gone into this exam. It was my first time taking this, this uh, professor's exam. And so I didn't really know how it was going to be formatted, but now I do. So now I can give it another go and try a little bit better, a little harder, right? Um, I'm trying to think of any other ways that thought swapping. I really like the truth method, though, because sometimes we have to ask ourselves, is this absolutely true? And for me, I will share a tidbit. I treat my anxiety sometimes like it is the most annoying person I know. Because if you ignore it, she's going to keep coming back around. <laughs> she's going to keep coming back around saying the same things over and over again. So you have to talk back to the anxiety, right? Like, that's not true. Yeah, I didn't do so well on this test, but that does not mean that I should give up. 